Hello, my name is Derek Jacoby. In the next 15 minutes, I'd like to convince you that you can create new life forms and interrogate the world around you at a basic genetic level. And when I say you, I don't mean highly trained industry academic biologists. I mean you, the person who hasn't had a high school biology class in 30 years and may barely know what DNA is. We did just this at a biohacker space in San Francisco called BioCurious last summer. I'll get into that in just a bit. The reason it's possible to come into biology at this point and create things without as much background knowledge as it used to take is that biology is on its way from being a science to being a technology. Electronics has done this over the past couple decades. Although still nominally a branch of physics, you don't think about physics when you press the play button on your DVD player. I would argue that even the people who designed the DVD player didn't think much about physics. They thought about, move, they thought about moving around building blocks, chips, that do various electronic functions. And maybe the makers of the chips thought a lot about physics. But it's really buried under a large number of layers of abstraction. And biology is beginning to get some of these abstraction concepts so you can interact with it as a user of a technology rather than a scientist. It's also becoming an information science. As sequencing technologies get better and better, the amount of information we're dealing with in biology makes it truly an information science. And that's what originally attracted me to the field. I was at Microsoft for about a decade, with most of that being part of Microsoft Research, designing speech recognition systems, which is a space where you're dealing with large masses of information and bringing pattern matching technologies to bear on that information. So I became really excited as I saw biology begin to turn into an information science and where some of these computer skills could apply to it. And this is happening on both the synthesis side and the sequencing side. On the sequencing side, users of this technology enable things like a group of high school students who went and looked at fish from the fish markets and sushi restaurants and analyzed that fish by means of a uh, technique called uh, polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. They amplified sections of the fish uh, and did a process called DNA barcoding where they could compare it against a database of known species and determine that a large proportion of the fish was really not what it was being sold as. So if high school kids can take these technologies and immediately apply them, you know biology is well on its way to being a technology rather than just a science. Well, I want to talk for a while about the synthesis side because synthetic biology is what's really exciting me these days. And we're achieving some great successes in synthetic biology. There was a team at Harvard this past year who took a tomato. Tomatoes are high in an antioxidant known as lycopene and decided they wanted to optimize this tomato to produce lycopene. Within just a few weeks, they had a tomato that produced 1,000 times the lycopene of ordinary tomatoes. Similarly, a group at Rice University decided they wanted to create a bacteria that digested sugar and produced butanol. And people are making everything glow green. The cat you see on the left here was the result of a group of scientists who wanted to insert a therapeutic DNA into a cat but needed a marker gene or some way of telling that the DNA they'd inserted had actually made it to the cells. So they took a yeah, protein from jellyfish, green fluorescent protein, and inserted it along with their therapeutic DNA. And we end up with this glowing green cat that I'd hate to have standing hovering over top of me at 2 a.m. on the pillow. But it's really cool. And glowing things really yeah, are uh, interesting and attractive as an introductory biology project simply because it's easy to visualize that you've been successful. So I mentioned BioCurious, this biohacker space in the San Francisco Bay Area. I went down there this summer, helped them build their lab up, uh, and then taught the first two biology courses at BioCurious. In the first one, we took 24 students who had very little biology background. Some of them high school biology, a couple of them had a university course or two, but most of them were uh, uh, by no means biologists. And we taught them to create a green E. coli. This is a bacteria, and we inserted the same green fluorescent protein from jellyfish that makes that cat glow green. Now, we would have liked to have done a cat in some ways, but there are ethical and regulatory problems with working with mammals. Um, I'll get into that one a little bit later. I'm going to peel back some of the layers of the onion now and talk about just how we achieved this, uh, this transformation. Not because the processor, not because the uh, lab itself was so unique, 
Thousands of labs around the world have created green E. coli. Yeah. But because it's indicative of the way that you would work with synthetic uh, uh, biology and making your own constructs, if you wanted to create a protein or a new drug you wanted to try, uh, uh, or uh, basically anything that's created uh, uh, through, uh, through a gene. Now just a few years ago, you would have had to have gone to find that gene in the wild, pull your jellyfish out of the water, uh, and with uh, restriction enzymes and ligation enzymes, uh, slice the uh, bit of DNA out and ligate it all back together. You don't have to do that anymore. The way that you do this today is by designing the DNA that you want in silico on the computer, and then you mail that uh, off uh, to a DNA synthesis company, and for as little as 25 cents a base pair, a couple hundred dollars for some uh, uh, smaller genes, you'll get back the DNA that you can insert into your organism. So we used a process in uh, our lab uh, that is a little bit different than a lot of the professional biology labs did. In hackerspaces, we're really looking at trying to make these processes as approachable and cheap for the ordinary user as possible. So rather than using complicated equipment, like the electroporation machine that would have been used in a professional lab, we tried to use off-the-shelf reagents. So we went to the drugstore. We got a laxative, polyethylene glycol, and we got Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. Now the polyethylene glycol is a chemical that's also an antifreeze, and you're told not to let your dog lick it because they'll get diarrhea and possibly die if they drink enough of it. The same thing that causes diarrhea, the opening of the cell walls, uh, the pores uh, in the intestinal membrane, is the same thing we're exploiting in order to make it a good transformation reagent. It's opening up the pores in the bacteria so the DNA can slip in. Now before it slips in, there's one other thing you have to do. Bacterial cell walls are negatively charged, and the backbone of DNA is negatively charged. These will repel each other. The magnesium ions, the positive ions in magnesium sulfate, neutralize the negative charges on the DNA and allow it to slip in through those pores we've just opened up. The other thing on this DNA that we're inserting is an ampicillin resistance gene. Yes, we're making antibiotic resistant bacteria in the lab for a very specific purpose that only a small fraction of the bacteria are taking up this new DNA. And in order to separate the ones that have taken up our new DNA from the ones that have not, we plate this bacteria on a medium containing ampicillin. And only those bacteria that have taken up the new DNA along with the ampicillin resistance gene will survive. Well, we incubate it overnight and the next, tight, uh, next day glow a black light on it. And every single one of the 24 students came in and created their own organism. But this is ha taking place in hackerspaces. It's part of a larger movement. About a year ago, I helped found the Victoria Makerspace, a hackerspace here in Victoria, BC. And at that point, we were about the 10,000th hackerspace around the world. It's a movement that's becoming huge. I went to Maker Fair in the San Francisco Bay Area this last summer, and there were about 100,000 people there over the course of the weekend. In Vancouver, we had a mini Maker Fair with about 5,000, and this was the first year we offered it. So the DIY movement, or the do-it-yourself movement, is really growing by leaps and bounds. And hackerspaces are really the center point of this movement. It's an open technology playground, founded on the ideals of sharing information and knowledge and skills and tools, and really make it, making it possible to own the technology yourself and do things you never thought possible. At the Victoria Makerspace, we've got a metalworking shop, we've got a wood shop, We've got welders, we've got a uh, casting furnace and a forge. Um, we've got a bunch of electronics uh, assembly tools. So we've got a laser cutter, a 3D printer, a vinyl cutter, and really all the tools you need to manufacture things from either a computer-driven process or a hobbyist process. And hobbyist results are the main things that have come out of the Victoria Makerspace so far, mostly because it's so young. Although we have a couple of projects that might end up being commercialized. I have seen very commercial projects come out of hackerspaces and other areas though. Real businesses getting founded out of these technology playgrounds. The only difference between biohacker spaces and regular hackerspaces is that the technology we're interested in is biology. There are a couple hackerspaces out there that are just devoted to biology at this point. Genspace in New York was the first one. And then BioCurious, which opened in the summer in the San Francisco Bay Area, was the second. And it's really useful to play with biology in these group settings. 
You can share ideas and techniques and technologies. You can share safety information and make sure that the lab you're working in is adhering to safe work practices and adhering to all the regulations it needs to. Now on the safety front, some of you might have been taken aback by the fact that we're working with E. coli because the main place you hear about E. coli is in the newspaper when it makes people sick and kills them. That's a very different E. coli than we work with in the lab. The E. coli in the lab is officially classified as non-pathogenic or incapable of causing human disease. So we use a lot of that and we use a lot of yeasts. But we tend not to move into plants or mammals because of the greater safety and regulatory concerns. So biohackerspaces are this technology playground and an innovation incubator. Now I want to describe the second class that I taught at BioCurious this summer because it starts to make it relevant to medical informatics. And this is a place that has been largely uh, populated by big players at this point. And I wanted to make it accessible so people could understand more of what was going on and take control of the technology themselves. We brought students in and gave them the option of looking either at their actin-3 gene. This is the gene that determines fast twitch or slow twitch muscles. Many, many sprinters have a fast twitch form. Many marathon runners have the slow twitch form. Or we gave them the option to look at BRCA1. Now BRCA1 is probably the scariest gene that you can look at. It in large part determines cancer risk to breast cancer, ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, and is involved with mutational control. We did everything we could to talk people out of looking at BRCA1. We told them they might make a mistake and scare themselves when they got a result they didn't expect. We told them they might swap their sample up with their neighbor. We told them that they uh, might get a, uh, a result they believed in that showed a mutation have to spend money to get it confirmed uh, in a true medical lab. We told them they might not be able to keep the information secure that their data might get up onto Facebook, and uh, this is in the U.S., their insurance company uh, might uh, deny coverage for a pre-existing condition. There are all sorts of reasons that you don't want to make medical decisions based on an inexperienced lab technician in a non-certified lab. But despite all of these cautions, about two-thirds of the students decided they wanted to look at BRCA1. And what this tells me is that people really want to have control over their own genetic information. They want to be able to look at it themselves without all the gatekeepers in the way, without the doctor's prescription, without the insurance company, without the, going to the hospital for a blood draw. They just want to be able to look at their own DNA. And we allowed them to do so through the same technique as the high school students who were sampling the fish that I showed you. Through the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, you can set up primers on either side of the gene you want to look at. And just like a DNA photocopier, amplify that section of DNA. So when you go to sequence it, you have a couple hundred base pairs to sequence and not three gigabases like every person's full genome looks like. This takes the problems out of the realm of big science. Companies like Monsanto, like the big pharmas, and puts them in the hands of individuals. We've seen another industry go from big science down to individuals, and that's the computer industry. In 1958, Thomas J. Watson is quoted as saying, I think there's a world market for about five computers. It seemed ludicrous now, but at the time, a computer was something that cost $100 million and took an army of technicians to service it. There were only a few organizations in the world that could afford one of these. But pretty soon, we had the personal computer revolution, and now it's the rare person in this room that doesn't have at least one computer on their person in the form of a phone or a, or a camera or a watch. We're seeing the same thing happen in biology. In 2001, it would have cost you about $100 million to get a full human genome sequenced. Today, that would cost about $5,000. And the driving force in biology is not Moore's Law. Moore's Law is this statement that says that every two years, for a given cost, processing power will double. Moore's Law is the line on this graph that looks almost flat at the top. Sequencing follows Moore's law up until about 2007, and then it's like dropping off a cliff with the advent of second generation sequencers. We have third generation sequencers coming down the pipe very quickly. So biology is going to continue increasing at a rate much, much faster than computers ever did. And I liken where we are with biotechnology right now as being where computers were in the 1970s. With the advent of the Homebrew Hardware Club in Silicon Valley, 
You had machines like the Altera on the upper left that were a few buttons and a few flashing lights, barely be able to get called computers. But pretty soon, people like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak came out of the Homebrew Hardware Club in Silicon Valley with the Apple One and turned it into the largest company in the world. We're going to see the same thing happen in biotechnology. But again, remembering it's not going to take 20 years like it did with computers. It's going to take just a few years because the pace of or the acceleration of change in biotechnology is so much faster than Moore's Law. So this is where biohacker spaces come in. In making the technology accessible at the grassroots level, letting people play with the technology themselves, come up with the problems that they want to solve. And when you get people with diverse backgrounds together solving problems, amazing things come out of it. We'll have new businesses founded. We'll have new industries founded. And this is important from a global competitiveness perspective. Of the 30,000 genomes that will be sequenced in 2012, full human genomes, a quarter of those will come from one institution, the Beijing Genomics Institute. China is making huge investments in biotechnology at this point. And there's no guarantee that the revolutions in biotechnology will come from North America in the way that the revolutions in computer technology did. The only way we can make this likely is to bring it down to the grassroots level in the biohacker spaces so the people of diverse backgrounds are coming together and sharing their knowledge and skills and forming industries that are truly innovative. And so that's what I invite you to do. Come into the biohacker spaces. Gen Space in New York, BioCurious in San Francisco, Makerspace here in Victoria, and many others that are springing up in an area near you. Create new life forms, interrogate the DNA of the world around you, and found a new biotech revolution. Thanks for listening.